In the wide expanse of the Thames estuary are some of the most remarkable relics of the Second World War. These strange steel structures were built to protect London from aerial and surface attacks by Nazi Germany. Abandoned, exposed the elements, they later became a broadcasting hub of pirate radio. I'm thrilled to have finally got the chance to visit this remarkable site. Welcome to the Red Sands Sea Forts. I'm just leaving the River Medway now. We're just turning to the east into the mighty Thames Estuary. There on the other side is Southend. That's Essex over there. And this was a hugely important part of the world. The River Medway, all sorts of vital British shipbuilding industries, naval base down there. And so you can see on the end of Sheppey here, you've got Garrison Point Fort, built in the 1860s, part of the invasion scare of the 1860s. Big installation there. And then on the other side of the Medway, you've got a Napoleonic Martello Tower that's uncovered at uh, low tide. You can walk to the shore. At high tide, it's cut off from the shore. That's got the coolest address in Britain. Number one, the Thames. You can buy it if you've got a spare couple of million quid. And really, they're all here, this density of military fortifications, to protect what lies that way, west. The biggest city in the world in the late 19th century, the richest city in the world, the biggest port, the capital of the world's largest empire, London. Just up ahead here is an extraordinary bit of history that I've always read about, always heard about, but never been up this close to. You can see three masts in the water there, and it's absolutely surrounded by a ring of boys in the water. That's because those three masts belong to the SS Richard Montgomery. And on board that shipwreck are 1,500 tonnes of high explosives. The boys are to keep people from getting too close. In August 1944, this was an American Liberty ship, an American ship that was uh, lent to the Brits during the Second World War. It was carrying a huge amount of explosives. It dragged its anchor, came out across here and hit a sandbank. After a couple of days of desperately trying to unload the explosives, the ship broke in half, rolled onto its side, and it lies there to this day. It's one of the most famous shipwrecks in British waters, and one of the most potentially dangerous. In the first few months of the Second World War, too many ships were sunk in the Thames estuary by German mines. Most of them laid by aircraft. Urgent action was needed. Guy Monson, a civil engineer, was called in to address the problem. Plans were drawn up and approval was given for the manufacture and installation of three sets of army forts and four naval forts in the Thames estuary. The result was something quite magnificent. Okay, I've come, come aboard now the Red Sands Fort. This is uh, the seven towers here. One of them can still be accessed by this ladder. Uh, there used to be walkways between them. You can still see the remains of one there, but the rest have all fallen into the sea. What an amazing place. These were built during the Second World War as anti-aircraft platforms. They were never intended to survive 80 years, but here we are. So the guys have just gone up this ladder. The padlock's been chopped off, so some trespassers have been here, so they're going to have to check what kind of state it's in. Extraordinary structures. They don't like they should survive. They're perched on these four poles buried into the, uh, the bed of the Thames and with these strange steel boxes on top, corroding, rotting, falling into the sea, broken windows, used by all the seagulls, cormorants, and on top of each one there would have been, well, both as guns, anti-aircraft guns, blazing away at the German Luftwaffe aircraft who used the Thames like a huge silver funnel on a moonlit night, pointing straight at the heart of London. It was an incredible navigational aid. And these forts were designed to make that journey up the Thames as painful as possible for the German Luftwaffe. It's always said, and I completely agree now that I'm here, these look like the Star Wars, well, Empire Strikes Back walkers in the, in the battle of the, on the ice planet of Hoth. It's said that the designer for Star Wars did get his inspiration from these otherworldly structures. Ugh. 
It's not quite being piped aboard, but welcome anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow. And that's how they would have got up during the war? That's great, yes. Right, that's okay. It's all safe to stand here? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You're, you're actually standing on the, this area here is a concrete plug which yeah. joins the legs together. Okay. And this is that trapezium point that I said about, remember, you know, the pyramid? Oh, that's where all the, the strength comes from, yeah. yeah. Wow, what an amazing spot. I mean, it's battered by conditions out here in the Thames. Well, it's, it's the most it? hostile conditions you can yeah. ever possibly imagine. When they built them, they must have thought it was just... The, the idea that we're here 80 years later no. is crazy, isn't it? Without any major works being done. Yeah. So when were they put up? The design went to um, the Ministry in 1941 yeah. from Guy Anson Monsall. Um, initially came up with the naval forks design, which is the two cylinders and the flat pedestal on the top. You know, and the both of guns either side at the top, and then on the outers you had the 3.7s. They went out first, and then these these were actually erected between July and September 1943. So by the time these were erected, the heaviest air attacks on London had stopped. Did they see a lot of action? Well, they saw 22 planes. 22 planes. And they took, I think, I believe it's 33 doodle bugs, and between them they seriously injured an e-boat which was coming up to place mines in the estuary. Right. As an early warning system, I mean, these were second to none because of the radar. They could see things almost when they lifted off from Norway, you know, and they could be prepared, everybody be down in the shelters, you know, batten down the hatches, so to speak, and stand ready for another, you know, for another raid. And they're out here in all weathers. Yep. It's been a bit scary in the winter. I can feel, the, you can feel it moving now, can't you? Very slightly shaking. We got, I mean, when, when you get the wash from the shipping lane, you, you can feel it a little bit more, but, you know, as I say, the tests that they did on, the, on these before they commissioned them, you know, 40,000 shots fired from a 3.7 inch being sprayed like, mercilessly with seawater. So they put a test one in and they just sprayed it with seawater? Yeah, that, that, that's what I've been led to believe, so. Unfortunately, since the pirate radio people left, this is, you know, places become um, a pilferer's paradise, let's say, I think it's probably the place. Oh, right? what, people come and steal bits off yeah. it? I mean, all the brass fittings off the radiators, which I'll show you, they've come on literally just smashed them all off. Yeah. They briefly took a new lease of life after they were decommissioned in 1956 when coastal defence was, was abolished and that's when the pirate radio guys stepped in and they were on various towers in the estuaries between 1964 and 1967. And then since 67, nothing? Pretty much, yeah, until uh, the project came along in 2003. Well done, you guys. Right, should you want to take me and show me yeah, some bits? Yeah, of course, bits? I'll start showing you around some of the rooms. Unfortunately, let's say this is a bit of a storeroom at the moment. This is the, the, the latrines. Amazing. Latrines, toilets there. And so what we do, we pump seawater up and we can flush those toilets. Really? This is one of the original baths. So you've got a bath here. Got, is that another bathroom that's, there? That's another bathroom inside. Oh, there you go, there. another bathroom there. Original bath still in there. How many people were using these facilities? It was uh, between the seven towers. There was 140 initially. When 140 they, people? When they went in in 1943. Then that number increased to 180 by the end of 1943. By early 1944, there was 220 people stationed on each set of seven towers. Do they each have their own facilities? Or? Well, you know, we've got the plans for each of the individual towers, but the, the accommodation was almost like a hotbed system. So somebody got out of bed, you know, cleaned the teeth, somebody else got back into that bed. And that was shared between officers and men alike, obviously in their separate accommodations. This is a, well, as you can probably gather from a project of this magnitude, we need plenty of place for storage for materials. This is one of our storerooms. What was it in back in the war? I believe it was um, something to do with uh, food servery, hence the hatch being in the way there. All right, and that's the that's that, the That was mess. a dining room, yeah. Okay. But there was dining rooms on all of the seven towers, obviously to cater for you know, poor weather and people not being able to cross the bridges safely. Yeah, it's a, it's a chilly day outside, but it's already quite hot in here. It would have been absolutely roasting in the summer. It would have been like an oven in here, wouldn't it? Potentially. Yeah. I mean, since we've started reinstating the windows, which I'll show you when we get back upstairs, you know, we noticed like, a massive hike of at least three to five degrees the minute we'd sealed those first windows in. Yeah. Hot, still day in the estuary. It'd have been warm up here. Right, where next? If you like, head through to the right, please, and then we're going to get head up the stairs. Level two. How many stories are there? Uh, we've just got the roof after this. Oh, okay. The, the sunshine deck, as we like to call sunshine it. Sunshine deck, look at that. Um, this was the original like, lifting equipment. There was a winch box that was mounted up here, but that's long since disappeared. And as you can see, the cables run through the two ginny wheels there, out onto a dolly, 
and you can see right at the end is the remains of the dolly. Yeah. There's also a, um, a navigation light. I mean, the light's long since gone, but the box is still there. This is due to be rem removed in the near future because this has got to be replaced, obviously, uh, to enable us to get the big sheets of steel up to repair, you know, to replace. Big job in itself. Isn't it just? Right, if you'd like to go through to, to the right. They had a light anti-aircraft attachment here. As you can see there, R-A-M-E, -E, it's Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. And you can also see that on your door just to your left. And that's light anti-aircraft, Remy detachment. Oh, you've put the windows back in here. Well, at the moment, let's say, there's still the original windows in here. Oh, right. It's a great space, isn't it, up here? It's beautiful, isn't it? It is like literally a, you know, a, a three-bedroom house. Yeah. Definitely. On still. Stilts. Very comfortable. And what would have happened in this room here? Th this was the, for the Remy, this was where they would have maintained the guns. Right. So any small firearms, you know, like Lee Enfield, Bren right. guns. You know, if they had a problem with one of the Bofors guns, they'd bring it up here. And this was essentially a workshop, so. Nothing wrong with the steel, is there? Yeah, nothing wrong with it at all. That'll last for a long time. So we had a structural survey done two years ago. And as I say, structurally, it's absolutely not 100% really? mint, but she's pretty damn good. It's all the ex exterior panels which are taking the weather in. Yeah, of course. And the plan was for last year before COVID came in was to get the shot blaster up here and start shot blasting and painting and replacing some panels. But You'll get that. Unfortunately, it's uh, affected everything. So, right, off to you. That room there's the ammo. So if you'd like to step through to the oh, left. That's all there. Oh, this nice room. So we're in the process of replacing all the hardboard and when we come out here on the, the 10th and the 11th all these boards are to be etched because hardboard because it's a, a shiny coat and doesn't take paint very well so the etch primer's going on and then they can all be painted. We've got the shot blaster so literally next time you see this place Oh that'll be lovely, yeah. It'll be a, a lot shinier. But as I say on the outer side, on the opposite side of the tower, that's the side that takes the worth weather in and that's the one we've got to replace the panels. But here we've got a decent crew room now we can we can work oh, in. Oh yeah, you'll be warm and dry in here. I tell you, you stick that fire on, I mean, you think it's warm now. You no, stick that fire on, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. This is not a bad Second World War posting. If you could have been anywhere in the war, I think I would have probably taken this little platform in the Thames Estuary. If you had a set of cards, yes, because you'd go a bit stowed, stowed crazy on, wasn't it? Set of cards and a load of mates to chat to. Yeah. You'd be right. Room. Great. This was the first room that we'd sealed up. Yeah. As I say, it's temporary modular windows, but it's preventing the like the egress of water or ingress of yeah. water. I should say. Feels nice and dry, doesn't it? That's a good chart. So where are we? Take the Thames Estuary. Terrifying, isn't it? There we go. Red Sands Tower there. Just on the edge of the deep water. But this, this is looking out towards like Holland area. Yeah. Because the currents here are so strong. So the Shivering Sands is another fort there, wasn't That's there? Correct. And there was a fort back there. And then as I say, yeah, that would have been Nor Tower, approximately here. It's amazing how shallow it is. I could almost walk out here from, almost, uh, yeah. from Whitstable, yeah. low tide. Yeah. yeah, got a couple of artifacts to show you. Um, quite prudent because they're actually both found in this room. That, as you can see, is an old valve out of a, an old radio set. Wow. So that's, a, that's cool. From the pirate radio? From, from the pirate radio era, yes. Yeah. Great. What else? And. You can just imagine the story behind this. Now, that's a mitre block that they used for cutting the architraves around the windows. Now, we found that just down here. Now, you can imagine, right, that it was probably the apprentice that lost it, and his master probably built that when he was an apprentice. So you can just imagine the rows that must have ensued. Yeah. It's like, now, which room did you put it in, you know? It's like, and then you found it. And then we found it. It was, so it was literally just sitting there. So when this panel is reinstated, there's going to be a little perspex Piece yeah, there, put this back in. and then that, that'll go back where, where we right. found it. We used those at school. Yep. I'm trying to remember how you cut, how you do it. It was not normally well, you'd normally have your piece in that way, and that would be your forty-five angle. That's right. That's that right. Way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This was one of the original like drinking water tanks. It's okay. also used for the ablutions, you know, for the flushings of toilets and baths. Yeah. Um, and this was the one of the diesel tanks. And you see there the feeds that run straight down to 
Well, just boiler. Oh yeah. Almost so, directly below us. Oh, the water is that just rain? That's collecting rainwater. Mostly collecting <laughs> rainwater. Yeah. No way. Plenty of and that. That's, that's all from the gully system. Yeah. On the outside. Great. You can see the measurements on there. It's lovely. Here we are. This is where the anti-aircraft gun would have been. Wow. It's just like nothing. I know where I've ever been. It's amazing. It's crazy, isn't Absolutely it? crazy. The towers, as, as you can see here, this is gun tower one. You've got another gun tower over there. Yeah. Now there's still a recording studio in that apparently. Right. All, all the boxes. As you can see, Radio 390, 630 to midnight. Um, and there was another another 3.7 inch anti-aircraft gun there. The opposite side of the control tower yeah. is another one. And then the far ground right over the back is where the 90 centimeter searchlight and the Gardner 6LW generators were. Uh, the control tower and the, the cookhouse, that's still got a working dumb wager in it, which is absolutely amazing. As I say, you can see with the two outcrops, that's where the 40mm the Bofors guns were. So you packed quite a punch here. I mean, it was a, it was a, a fort that was designed to knock planes out of the sky, bombers out of the sky, and also any German torpedo boats or mine layers coming yeah, up it here. It was mainly mine layers, but they yeah. could be spotted, you know, because of the radar. The radar, which was housed in the control tower, Obviously there was pickups on each of the towers, but the main equipment was in there, you know, and it, it just gave us the edge. Yeah. And powerful spotlights. The um, 90 centimetre searchlight is a carbon arc. The arc starts to dim, you move the rod in a little bit closer, and that, that increases the brightness. Okay. Um, we've got shell ready to use lockers here, uh, 32 in each. Unfortunately, where people have got on and opened them up, the weather started to get into them now because yeah. we, we did have them all bolted shut. And the magazine would have been down below with a lift or, or by no, hand? No, no, they, they, they would all bring them up, Just up by carry hand. Them up. It's um, a switch at the top of that door and that was basically a red light so that you know, if the gun was firing, nobody was coming up here apart from the gun crew, of course. And this is this is to... Armour plating. Armour, armour plating, yeah. right? So if an if a enemy round goes into there, it won't uh, it'll get it absorbed. Won't, it won't penetrate, yeah, yeah. it's just absorb the impact and the energy. That's the remains of our mast. Well, we had yet another break in. The guy's boat floated away. He decided to set a fire down there and destroyed the mast. So set a fire what, to get help? Basically, yeah, just so people could see him. So you've got the walkways here. This, this isn't a wartime one. No, that, that, was, that was instigated around 2004, I believe. But say, that's where the bridges would have fit, uh, would have fitted in between. Originally made by the Cleveland Bridge Co. Yeah. Um, but say, nothing was galvanized. But each of those, like each of the outer towers, could refuel, you know, or replenish from any side. Hence why you can see the towers, the tower down there, you know, with what's left of the fendering. We've replaced all the fendering on this tower. Yeah. And subsequently you haven't got any of that on the control tower. So originally there were these bridges between all of them or was it like a hub and, and a spoke? It was essentially the control tower, you know, was the main hub of, you know, all the activity with all the other bridges connecting to all the other individual towers. The longest span going out the back was, uh, I think it was about 47 metres. Oh, but... Such an unusual idea, isn't it? Building, a, it's a sea fort, it's, it's crazy. But you imagine you're the Germans coming down to follow the yellow brick road yeah. in towards London, and then the sea suddenly starts opening up in you. Yeah. Because yeah, these are these are all you know, built under secrecy. Yeah. You know, obviously deployed shock. under it. A nasty yeah. shock. One day your plan is to get these bridges back and... It's, it's, once G1's completed, it's to be a uh, World War II coastal defence museum yeah. and also pirate radio. We've got a lot more artefacts that we've collected over the years, but you know, as you can see the situation we're in at the moment, you know, we don't bring them out because they'll disappear. So. Well, I'm looking forward to coming back and seeing how you go. It'd be great for you know, to be able to show you exactly what we've achieved. So. After climbing down from the top deck, I met with Flo McEwen who has spent years researching the stories of these forts. In all your years of research in the forts, what are some of your favourite stories? I think for me, it was interesting just to see how it was living on the fort and, and the challenges these guys faced. Although they were in the middle of the war, the, the big challenge they had was boredom. If you imagine you're out there, you know, there's a bit of action, but not a lot of action. So there's a lot of hours in the day to fill. And the, the guys serving on the forts were encouraged to take up arts and crafts and knitting and, and painting and all kinds of things just to keep them occupied. 
And there's a tale of um, what they used to do to keep themselves interested. And what they would do is get a bacon rind and throw it to the seagulls. And then somebody came up with the idea of tying a piece of bacon rind to a long string and another piece of bacon rind and throwing it. And so two seagulls would grab it, swallow it, and there would be this amazing dance and a fight between the seagulls. And the guys would bet to see which of the two seagulls would be the winner. <laughs> it's extraordinary. But would have, yeah, it would have been challenges being out there, that's for Absolutely. Sure. And you know, loneliness, fort madness was something they talked about and just genuinely not knowing what was going to come. You know, we know how the war ended. We know how it played out. Those guys are out there in isolation and in darkness at night. It's a very long, dark night to spend on a fort. Um, and imagine you don't know what's coming. You know, the searchlight's up there looking out for the enemy aircraft. And once that, you know, the signal goes up that it's all about to kick off, suddenly they're in action. They must have had fun, those radio guys. It's a great place to be, and they were doing something quite cool. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? And if you remember back then, you know, radio was so dull. Normal radio was dull. So they needed, they needed an outlet, um, you know, for the more exciting music that was coming across from the States. And they needed somewhere to broadcast. And there they were out there in, in the coolest location ever, a real playground with this amazing music. It was just great times. There was something so magical about climbing onto that fort. It was envisaged that it would just last five years and nearly 80 years later, it's still standing proud, taking everything that the sea can throw at it. But, you know, time and tide has had an effect. So have a few vandals that have been out there. And if they're gonna restore those, the team here have got a huge challenge on their hands, but I just wish them all the best. And if they manage to get those back into wartime condition, well, then there'll be some of the most remarkable heritage properties to visit anywhere in the UK.